the ideas expressed on stage tonight are not necessarily those of the Mississippi Humanities Council. Um, and I would also like to thank our panelists who have come from far and wide uh, to serve on the panel tonight. Um, I hope y'all appreciate and, uh, and get something out of the conversation. There is a sign-in sheet in the back if you want to learn more about the Humanities Council, the work that we do, um, and there's some fans back there. So if you get caught, you can have one of our Humanities Council fans. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. Working, working real hard. 
our ad, ad you can still add it to us. Um, it's just a good work. I love my job. I tell everybody I love my job. Uh, very proud that we can just to just be a part of what's going on around in this county and in all of the school districts, really. It is exciting, and that's just a little brief token of what we're doing out at AAB. Glad to be here. Good morning, good evening. Amen. <laughs> what have I been doing all day? I've been all under uh, paperwork. So anyway, I know what time of day it is. <laughs> I am Adrian Hudson. I am also a proud Mississippi Delta gal, like uh, Ms. Coretta Jameson here as well. I'm a product of the Cahoma County School District and a graduate of Cahoma County High School. And I've had the opportunity to work in Cahoma County School District and to uh, now be executive director of a nonprofit that is designed with the sole purpose of helping to connect communities in educational enhancement efforts. So we believe that in order to build a better Delta, we need to start by building a better educational system and that we need to do that collaboratively. Like we cannot move where we need to go without it being a joint effort. And so that's what our work surrounds and it, it's all about looking at root causes. So right now, if you hear anything about RISE, people are probably talking about us helping to get teacher certified. That's the buzz right now. Uh, so that's a lot of the work we do, um, but we are committed to helping people from this community to get certified to teach. We believe that we need a more sustainable approach to um, getting teachers in our community. We want them to stay, and research shows us that if you're from that community, you're more likely to stay in that community. And so not that anybody else is doing a bad thing by helping people from other places to get certified, but our goal is to help to improve the number of certified teachers from this area uh, to teach in this area. I'm Joe Sweeney, I'm the director of the Mississippi Teacher Corps, and uh, I moved down to Mississippi. I'm originally from Michigan. I moved down to Mississippi in 2004, and I taught at uh, Eastside High School in Cleveland. Uh, I taught English and public speaking, and uh, then um, after my two years, I actually moved to Japan and taught there for a year, and then came back to Mississippi and taught for uh, four more years. And certification uh, and it's also a master's degree program and we actually have three of our uh, one alumni just alumni uh, graduated Saturday and then two of our first years are here today as well thank you all um, so much for elaborating a little bit about the work that you do and um, your involvement in your different capacities uh, can everybody hear me just okay so I think when talking about public education, um, especially in the Mississippi Delta, the conversation always leans on how schools and districts are so low performing, um, how there's a lack of resources, there's a severe teacher shortage. Um, and also when talking about the Delta, you talk about the intersection of uh, little quality of life and persistent poverty. However, you know, they're always talking about the struggles and the challenges
opportunity to see what's happening in so many other schools around the state and, and even in other states. I mean, simple things, if we're just blunt and, and, and really honest about it, we do not teach, treat our teachers fairly. We do not treat them like the professionals they are, and we don't give them the consideration that they deserve. And I think that's something we can fix. We can start right now today and say, teachers, you get a real lunch break at work. Everybody else who works, who has a degree, who works a job that's a professional, they are allowed to have a lunch break. And y'all looking around, if you're not a teacher, you're like, what in the world is she talking about? Do y'all feed the teachers? If you don't feed the teachers, they'll eat the children. That's what the book says. Well, I'm saying, we need to figure out a better way to do that. Now, I mean, I mean a lunch break where they can get some peace. They can move side. How many of you who are not teachers in this room have ever had to work with children for eight hours straight? More than two. More than two children for eight hours straight. All right. Out as a teacher and as an administrator, when you empower the teachers, everything is done correct. Top down does not work. A lot of our schools still want top down. You do as I say, you do it when I say, it does not work. As a teacher and as a human, when I close my door, I do what I need to do or what I want to do. And you have to respect that. But when they have an input, when they have a say in what, how things are going, they're going to do what they need to do anyway. You don't have to stand over someone and make them do their job. But if that's what you have to do, that person should not be around anybody's children. But to me, if it's shared leadership there, if everybody understands this is our goal, this is our vision, this is how we get there, what do you think, do we need to change anything, and we're all sitting together. The team that I work with daily, they can tell you from their mouths, I don't have to be around when they say it. They're gonna tell you she works with us. She, they don't work for me. They have jobs. They do their jobs well. But we have to empower them, give them all the resources that we can possibly give them, support them in any capacity, listen to them when they have problems, guide them when they are misdirected, and correct them when they totally out of base. It's a way to do any and everything without insulting someone's intelligence. If they don't know, they simply just don't know. If I don't know something, I just don't know this one. 
But it's a good thing to have good people working with you. And I have to say it. You want yourself being talked to. Save your long, big words for your dissertation, but talk to me like you got sense. And that's what I ask people because I was starting to ask you, if you use something I don't know, I'm like, what did you mean by that? You know, I, that's just me. It doesn't mean that I'm slow. It doesn't mean that I don't understand all that you're trying to say to me. But let's make our parents feel comfortable when they come to our schools. Let's welcome them in. Let's ask them what they think. Let them have an input. Let them have something positive to say about the school. And let's not always call our parents and tell them, Lil' Johnny over here acting up. What about Lil' Johnny did and turned his paper in? Lil' Johnny said his seat and did exactly what I told him to do. Those are the type of phone calls that when Johnny does act up, it won't be a problem with you. The problem is going to be taking care of Johnny. So those are some simple things that we're finding out that really, really work in our school. I just want to share that with you. But what I'm saying is that we actually have the boys to talk to each other and to relate things. Because some of the issues I face, they're not facing. But some of the same things that I've already went through, they're going through now. So I do have accessibility to other principals and not just early college principals. I talk to other administrators that may have similar things uh, going on in the school district. I even call former principals and ask them, well, what do you think about that? And they give me advice. You know, you have to be open. I go to my teachers, I ask them, what do you think about this? Because I don't have all the answers. I understand it. But if we work together, we can get it. Adrian, I see you picked up the mic. Would you like to? I just picked up the mic because for me, in my truth, when I was an administrator, I had a network of people with a long list, like you just said. But
participants now. So that, I know it doesn't happen to everybody, but it, it would happen. And so I, I don't think there's a, any way to drive off a, a good teacher uh, more quickly than to micromanage them and, to, and give them a script. You, if, if you want to keep a good teacher, as you, you were saying, you give them that freedom, let them teach, let them do what they know to do, let them experiment and maybe fail sometime, make mistake. But if they're good, they'll fix it, they'll get better, and they'll be a good teacher. And, and they'll appreciate the freedom that they have uh, to, to be able to teach what they want to teach. This question for you, Joe. Um, a lot of your work is helping to place teachers in areas across Mississippi, particularly in critical needs areas like the Delta. We know that teachers have a hard time passing certification exams like the Praxis. Um, you either have to have a 21 on the ACT um, in order to opt out of taking the Praxis 4. Adrian, I would love for you to continue this conversation because I know you deal firsthand with helping educators pass the practice exams. I, and I know this because Mississippi Today, in collaboration with the Hickman Report, which is a national news organization um, that focuses on innovation as well as inequality in education, we teamed up to do a one-year investigation into the teacher shortages in the Mississippi Delta in Asia and was a part of a solution story that we wrote um, with the work that she's doing to help alleviate um, some of the teachers and certification and how that affects education. Well, first I am going to um, put in my disclaimer and say it is not my work. It is the work of a lot of people who are really committed to building a better Delta. So we've been blessed with an awesome team and we have put our heads together and really um, we just, we, we took all of that, kind of the same ideas that we know. Again, my truth, I'm just thinking from my classmates, uh, 
friends of mine that I know who have been successful in so many other places and so many other uh, professions. I have a friend that's an accountant, a friend that's a lawyer, a friend that's a nurse practitioner, and none of them had a 21 on ACT. And that has nothing to do with the quality of work that they do and how successful they are in their lives. We have to look at something else other than the test. I'm not saying that the test isn't important because I'm the main proponent of everyone should not be a teacher. Like we, I, I will always get up and say it, and I'm okay with people getting upset with me when I say it, that it may not be for you, and that's okay. Teaching is not for everyone. But what I am saying is we have to get beyond just putting labels on people and saying, oh, you don't have this score, then you can't do this. And so, um, but our work is, okay, now that we know that that's a problem, what else can we do? Because traditionally, we We try to, so we pair all our first years with second years, so they, when they come back from classes, we provide lunch for them, they, they uh, talk about things that are going on in the classroom. Um, we, we help them problem solve. I don't, <laughs> they're shaking their head, no, I'm not that <laughs> I like to tell them that we appreciate what they do, especially you know, toward the end of the program. But it's, it's great, uh, I have a good position because I get to see them grow over the few years, and that's, that's really uh, something special to see. So I do appreciate them, I probably don't tell them as much as I should. <laughs> um, again, we can address all the issues over and over and over and over again, but there are some measures being taken to improve education here in the area. Every school here is an enough school. Um, again, I mentioned earlier that you all two years ago were a and now you maintain a seat. Can you talk about what is working? What did you guys do? What did you implement to improve your letter grades? I think the most effective thing we did was collaborate more just with each other. Uh, you know, pure observations, not just giving someone a sheet of paper and say, well, go in and see what so-and-so does. You, you can't do it that way. You have to have a purpose as to why you're asking one teacher to go in to view another teacher. Maybe you just want that teacher to notice some simple things that a teacher does to even open a classroom or close the lesson out, something simple, but be very specific in what you're doing and not just send them in there. You can go in with them. Some of the, some of the small things I think we're finding out more and more is that, you know, the, the thing that the kids are using in the groups, we actually use it. We, we use it to tell jokes. We had to refrain from the pictures at times. But it, it makes our day go a little bit faster and it makes it a little funner if that's a word. <laughs> uh, but I mean, but it is, it's, it's something about when we all get together that makes us, no, not being a clique, but it makes us feel good about ourselves. Is that we're working toward a goal. And I'm not just saying stuff to say stuff to sound good. But what works is that we're working together. It's not that we're competing against Clarksdale or Coahoma County or Tunica or Equipment. It's nothing like that. We simply want to make the best decision possible for our students. And we do one simple thing. We love first. You cannot get to their heads without loving them first. They're going to act with you until they get to know you. They're going to test you. You do it one student, will you do it with the other student? Do you have favoritism? Will you turn your back at the wrong possible time to chew it? They try that. But once they figure out you are there for them, you won't have the unwanted behavior so often. We pay attention to our students. We look at them when they come in. We say good morning to them, even when they don't want to speak to us. I do it every morning. Good morning. Sometimes I get one kid. I said, well, good morning. Let's try it again. Because they come in with so many things that we that's, that's out of our control. But what we try to do is set the atmosphere. The expectation that when you come through these doors, you're going to learn something that's going to better your life. We can't leave you like we found you. We got to make you better. That's our job. Even if we have to pull a little bit, push a little bit, swing to the side a bit, we got to get you where you're supposed to be. But what works with us is our communication with each other. I love working with them folks over there. Sometimes we stay too long at the workplace. Sometimes my husband has to come and say, are you coming home? I say, oh, Lord. You know, I put me at home being a wife. But it's, it's our collaboration with each other. And it's the expectation that we're going to do well when we get our kids in. So that's what's working for the most part. It's something very simple. Communication with everybody. 
not just with the students, not just with the teachers, with the parents as well. We try to post as much stuff as we can on Facebook. Guess what, everybody's on Facebook. We have a number of people all on Twitter, but our group is a Facebook group. If we put it on Facebook, guess what, they got it. So simple things like that are working out at uh, AAB. I promise you it is, and it's gonna get better. I guess I'll pose the same question to, to you two in your uh, capacities. What, what do you see what's working? I think the first thing that's working is um, being willing to work with other people has been, um, it's been a door opener for us. If that's, yeah, it has opened many doors. For example, we'll be working with Kahoma Early College starting next year with a, a grant we were able to get together um, with the Walton Family Foundation that's gonna help us to improve um, professional development and um, helping to mentor more teachers and really try to bring in um, more opportunities for us to get teacher feedback and then to find out for them, how can we help them more? And once we sat down and we start talking about, hey, this is where we can improve. Like, hey, these things are going well, but this is where we can improve. And then we were able to say, okay, what can we do to solve that problem? And I, and I think that's been working best for us as an organization, for sure. Um, but we've had the opportunity to pretty much work with every school district, and I'm squinting because that light is right in my face, guys. The, sun, the, beautiful, the beautiful sun is setting, but, um, but that has worked really well. We also have an education conference that we were really excited to bring to the Mississippi Delta because as an administrator, I know I often felt like it was unfair that whenever there was, uh, we, we had specific learning needs, it was go to Jackson, go to the Coles, right? Those are the places, which is great when you want a vacation, but when you're looking to build the capacity of your staff, you probably can't afford to send 20 people to the Gulf Coast if you're on a fixed budget the way we were. And so one of the first things we did as an organization was say, hey, how can we get more people together in one place and provide them what they say they need? And so this is our third year doing the IRISE conference. And so what's working with that is um, looking at the surveys, asking people for feedback, and asking them what sessions do you want to have, what workshops, what things can we do to provide you better assistance. And we've been able to get some really good results from there. And of course, um, the SESS program has been very successful. Um, we have really, really good rates. We've been, uh, we were able to get we have about, it's about 15 teachers that are teaching in a classroom now out of the 20 that have um, participated in the program. They're teaching in the classroom. They are now um, certified or one test away is pretty much everybody. We have two people who will be enrolling again next year, but we're gonna help them until we can't help anymore. And that's what we're gonna do. So um, we're really excited about this. So those things are working. It's just a matter of us being willing to say, if it's not working, Find somebody who can help me to fix it and make it work. And I think being okay with being wrong or being there being a need or room for improvement, I think that may be one of our biggest handicaps, if we're really honest about it, is that it's hard to say, I don't know and I, I need help. You know, that that's tough. And so um, for us, those are the things that are working, but they're working because we're willing to collaborate and willing to communicate and say, I need help. We did a study a couple years back. One of our participants uh, looked at why uh, alternate rock teachers stay for more than five years. So she interviewed people and asked them about it. And uh, the number one reason was they felt a connection with the students and they loved working with their kids. Um, so, uh, and then another piece to that was they, they had a good um, connection with the school. So they, they knew the teachers, like what you talked about, having fun at work, um, being, you know, having uh, uh, your friends, working with your friends at school, uh, and having teachers that you can go to for support. Uh, and the other piece was they felt a connection to, to the community. Uh, and so that's something that we've emphasized as a program now. And we have them study the, the community and interview people from the community, interview teachers, uh, and, and get themselves embedded. And so on the other side of that, if you are someone in the community who wants to, to help, um, you know, 
get to know a teacher, help them out, show them around, you know, help them find a place to live. All of that goes a long way in helping keep, uh, keep those teachers in those communities. I think a lot of the things you all mentioned are things that can happen in the community at a local level. Um, we all know that folks in the Delta for so long have often felt unheard. No one at um, the state level has listened to them. We even wrote a story previously about a number of bills um, that would help to alleviate the teacher shortage, whether it was creating an alternate pathway to certification um, or something of that sort. All of those bills died. And there's been previous bills that have been proposed that would, would have helped um, that issue that have all died in committee also. Is there anything or are there any um, initiatives from the state level, whether it's lawmakers filing bills or the State Department of Education, what can they do to help improve education in Clarksdale and Oklahoma County in the Mississippi Delta? Well, I think we, we are seeing a lot of progress now. I must I will say, you know, as a teacher and administrator, we didn't see as much movement from the State Department as we thought we should have and things that we, we thought should have been happening. And I, I definitely felt unheard on, on a lot of cases, particularly when we first came up with the you need a 21 on the ACT to enter into a teacher education program. I remember being an intern, getting licensed to become an administrator. And I remember speaking with MAE, speaking with Chuck Espy, and he put me on the phone with the aide to the governor and we're trying to get that uh, changed, but before it ever became a law, I knew what a detriment that would be to our community when we see the percentage of students that are leaving with the 21 or above on the ACT. So what happens is a lot of people who probably could have gone to school to be a teacher, um, who wanted to be a teacher, didn't have that 21 um, to, uh, to get into a teacher education program. They had to come out in another degree and possibly do an alternate route program. Not to say there's anything against alternate route because there's some great alternate route teachers. But if you could go through the program and have to do a practicum and do student teaching and do all those things, it's going to benefit you. It's going to be helpful. And so like that was one of the things that I worked uh, to try to get some, 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 some traction around, but nobody was listening. I was just talking, y'all. So, <laughs> but uh, what, now we have uh, Dr. Corey Murphy, we have Felton, uh, uh, Cortez Moss, uh, Crystal Corbett, all those people are working down at um, the State Department who actually have lived and been uh, uh, participants in the educational systems of the Mississippi Delta and places like the Mississippi Delta. So it's easier for them, um, even, um, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting her name and, if it, and, and I feel so bad, but even one of the, the previous principals, she's working on her doctorate now, um, Van Cleve, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Ms. Van Cleve is uh, working on her doctorate degree and she's, that's what she chose to research is actually alternative routes to certification because as a principal, she worked with teachers who were excellent teachers that were having a problem getting certified and, and she saw that those were the teachers that, teachers that helped her to move her school to an A-level school and it, it didn't seem right or fair to her to even, to, to make those stipulations based on something as simple as just a test. Not to say that a test isn't important because again, we do need some something there to determine whether or not someone is um, doing what needs to be done for children. I'm not that person who's saying just get rid of everything, but I do think there, there has to be another way. Guys, we need teachers and that, that, that number is getting less and less. I think over the last five years, we're down like 50% on the number of teacher certification licenses that have been even given from MDE. So I say all that to say, they're, they're working on a number of, of projects out of um, the State Department. Um, they're, they're piloting a program with the Kellogg Foundation where they're doing internships and uh, mentorships. It does not include the home County um, just yet. So they're piloting first to see how that's gonna work out. Um, and they are also doing the alternate route where it's gonna be performance-based. They're looking at a certification that's performance-based. That's happening now um, and being piloted in a number of districts. So there are efforts that are happening to say how do we address this problem and do something about it. And this is probably the most traction we have seen in, in 
my career for sure. You know, when I started uh, as a teacher, I remember sitting in the audience, all uh, eager beaver. Uh, my, my email address was and still is excited about teaching at yahoo.com. Y'all, I was ready. Do you hear me? I was so excited to be a teacher. And so I remember sitting in the audience at one of those conferences on the Gulf Coast and uh, hearing the state superintendent, it was at that time it was Hank Bounds, but he, he said, he looked at all the data and basically told us that if we could get rid of the Mississippi Delta, we would move from being way down here and move shoot way up here. And I remember being heartbroken. I remember being crushed. Like, we are not to be moved. We are not something you can just exterminate. How dare you say such a thing? Instead, let's put some work and some effort into helping us. What are you doing? How do we help you, right? And so I just remember feeling so upset 15 years ago, or I guess about 13 years ago. And I remember saying, I, I, I'm ready to go back home. I want to do something about that. At this time, I was uh, teaching in South Mississippi near uh, where I was going to grad school. And I decided to come home and do something. And that's what I encourage everybody else to do. If you don't like it, change it. My mom used to say that. So if you don't like it, change it. Let's change it. I would like to add, I mean, there's a lot of things I think they could do at the state level, um, but I think they fall into two categories. The first would be, and I can see anybody right now, <laughs> um, but the first is financial. So I think paying teachers what they deserve to be. Uh, I think it's, uh, <laughs> but in reality, you know, I work at the School of Education at, at the University of Mississippi, and we see our graduates go straight up to uh, Tennessee, to Arkansas, to other states because right off the bat they're going to make ten thousand more. So um, that's that's yeah, plus plus all the bonus and everything. Now I will plug one thing um, for those that are teachers: if you've been teaching for three years and you do um, national board certification, you get a, a raise of uh, in most counties it's six thousand, and in Oklahoma County you get a ten thousand dollars a year raise if you are a national board certified teacher. So if you have a few years of experience, um, there's something called the World Class Teaching Program at the University of Mississippi, and you can do it for free. Um, and the, they'll walk you through the process of getting National Board Certified, and you get 10000 extra a year, which is uh, about a 25% raise based on the, the base salary of the first year teacher. Um, the other category I would say is, uh, is state image. And this, remember the disclaimer at the beginning that said the, the views still, <laughs> don't, uh, you know, you've got a, a state flag that has a hate symbol on it. Um, you gotta get rid of that. That, that from an outside standpoint, um, someone you know, coming from Michigan, coming down here, that's not something I want to see. It's not, uh, and people see that and say, I don't, I don't want to go to Mississippi. Um, you know, they're removing it from parks and other states. It's, it's gotta go. Um, the other thing is, <laughs> it's, it's, it's heritage, your, your heritage, you, you lost an award funding for slavery. That's not, that's no heritage to me. Um, the other piece is, um, that, you know, it goes like uh, 1523 that were discriminatory. Um, that kind of stuff has got to go. You can't, it, people are not going to come to the state and teach if they feel like they're not going to go. Um, so I will turn the conversation over to you. Um, I know the Humanities Council folks reached out to folks um, in the Clarkson Municipal School District. I'm not sure what happened there. If there's any educators from that district, um, I see also Amanda Johnson here, who's from the charter school. Um, if you guys would like to share anything or ask any of the panelists any questions, please feel free to do so. I also see some former students from Clarksdale High School who are here. I'm not trying to, you know, pick on anybody, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, if you would like to share at this time or even ask any questions of our esteemed panelists, please feel free to do so now. And we have a mic or if you're loud enough and you like to stand up, you can do that too. So, not everyone at once. No one?
teacher residents are getting, um, we're starting a new program for teacher residency um, where we are helping to pay the tuition of people who would typically um, apply to be a, an IA or a teacher assistant. Um, so paying part of the tuition, um, giving them support to pass the practice, so we're really excited about how we that um, and partnering with our rise and um, just appreciate hearing um, from another administrator here in town who's really working to, to try to make the deal for kids and so hopefully collaborate with
giving free services in our community that want to help our children that cannot get into our schools because we won't answer an email. We won't return a call. Y'all, there's something wrong with that. It is something wrong with that. And we need to be honest and upfront about it. And we need to be saying that at the school board. We need to be saying that at every time we can get a microphone in front of our hands. It is ridiculous. And we can't fix it until those people have an opportunity to get in front of the children. Right? You, we're gonna, we're, we have to say enough is enough. Hold our leaders accountable for being leaders.
that has that is dealing with generational poverty. But what do we do about it? So I think you're absolutely right. You don't want to know what a teacher has to say to you when you just left a house and you were called 12 different four-letter words before you got on the bus, right? You don't want to know if I if I didn't have a home to, to actually sleep in last night, right? Like I didn't have a bed. So we have students who are dealing with real issues, real grown-up issues that they shouldn't be dealing with, but they but it's the it's the truth of the matter. And we know that. So what can we as educators do to, to fix that? And I think when we start talking about funding, if we want to put funding somewhere, that's not where we should put it. We need social workers in our schools. We need social workers, we need counselors who can actually counsel and not have to do testing all day long. But like we need to give them an opportunity. Now I know we have to test. I get it, I get it, better fun is that we have to do it, but we do need to figure out how do we get funding to make those things happen in our school that we know children need. Yes, yes. Oh just, to, just to say a little bit, uh, something we did implement that's a part of our culture now at our school is that we do something called social form. Again, not Ms. Jameson's idea, the teacher's idea. And so when they started talking, I said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I like, yeah, right. Because this is the part of the, the, the week where they get a chance to speak and to talk. They're as free as a bird. They have guidelines now. They're not using, you know, cursing and things like that. But they can stand up and talk and relate and talk about things that affect them at their age. Yes, I got the big kids. But you will be shocked at some of the things that they have to go through. And just to make it to us. Yes. You know, I'm always amazed at a few of my kids that I know their home life is not right. But yet the, the kid comes in, smile on the face, you know, it, because it's the environment. You know, it's a, you won't fail them that you just really want to. You know, but that small portion of the week that we devote to listening to our kids is well worth it. They look forward to it. And it's simply allowing them to talk and express about things that are that, that are valuable to them. It can't be about what we want to talk about. It has to be about something they would like to talk about. And is that like assembly or is that in class? It's in the classes. And sometimes our classes do combine because sometimes you have topics where you need a male and a female to discuss so that they can have more than one aspect on it. But it works when everybody's doing it school-wide. Okay, so I, I, the mic is currently lit, so I don't need to make it litter by having <laughs> um, But uh, Stuart has reminded me our time has come to an end. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming and sharing this conversation about education County. Thank you for the Humanities Council for putting on this event. Thank you to Meraki for hosting it here. Thank <laughs> you.